God. Woo. Son. I don't know what I don't know what you do after all this. Wow. I was standing over there with Brother Lehman a minute ago and I said, My God, some people come by me. I said, Indianapolis 500, man. I don't mind being there, but when you're half blind, it's scary. Wow, it's so wonderful. God bless you, wonderful praise singers and Sister Lehman. That's Sister Lehman playing, correct? Yeah. Amen. We're just honored to be here again. It's been a pleasure for me uh, to be with you, and uh, I really mean that. And it's, you, you've, I, I want to say this without being rude. I have to practice that because I'm normally rude. You have been so much easier for me to preach to this year than you were last year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and I, I have listened to Brother Woodward's uh, admonition, and his kind admonition that he's given to me that, as he says to me, uh, uh, bro, it's, it's a culture thing, bro. It's, it's just, it's a Canadian thing. And I said, well, that's what I am. I got, I'm a Jesus culture. I, I want to get into the word. I got my watch tonight. Okay, I'm ready. I got my watch. I want to get into the word of the Lord real quick. I feel like, uh, I really do. I feel like the Lord has given me a trilogy, like movies and DVDs. I've got a trilogy. The first night, I've talked about the power and peril of perception. And I think we carried on into this morning about our perception of how much God loves us. And that, the, and that the upheaval that was in his heart brought deliverance to the situations with Israel and to people. Well, I, I want to conclude with this, this message tonight, if I can. And, uh, and uh, I, if you don't mind, I'm old, okay? I look really young, but I'm old. And, and, and I'm running out of gas. I, I, I used to be able to preach five, six night camp meetings, three, four, five, back to back. Those days are gone. Geritol's on its way. And, and so I, I don't have the pizzazz I used to have. But if, if you just help me for a few minutes, I'm going to take a hard swing at the ball. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Okay. And uh, to, to save time because... Uh, well, we've just had a long time juking and jamming and throwing down. So uh, I'm going I'm to paraphrase all, a bunch of this, okay? Abraham is out there in the, in the desert there, and, and three visitors come up to visit him, and he runs real fast to talk to him, and he wants to be hospitable to him, and he says, I'll fix you some lunch, and I'll get some stuff. And he gets a servant to get a, 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 a creature, and they fix it all up, and they give it to him, and... And so, so that takes care of the first, you know, seven or eight verses. In verse 9, he says unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were well, were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. Now, now I don't want this rated X, but I need to explain to you what he's talking about. Okay, and just a simple thing. She's gone through the change of life. Okay? She's not producing a basketball team. She's not giving birth to a football team. She, she's, she, she's just not producing. Okay, and that's a normal thing. God has ordained that for men and women to go through seasons, and women go to a certain time where there's no re more reproductive issues going on, and that's where Sarah is. Okay, you got to understand this because I'm fixing to flip out right now because, because God gets a kick out of messing with you. I wish I had time. I'd like to preach a message to you about God's got an attitude. 
He loves when he says something to you and I and says, that's impossible. And he goes, <laughs> he, he's, he's got an attitude. <laughs> he created the universe with words and you're worried about a baby. <laughs> Oh, God, help me, Lord. Please help me. So said, uh, it ceased to be after the man of a woman. So she's gone through the change of life. Therefore, Sarah left within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, and shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Now, now you're the theologian. You can explain this to me later. I don't get this. The chick laughed, and he talks to Abraham. I don't get it. She's in the tent. She hears the promise. She breaks out laughing inside, and God challenges Abraham. Hey, how come your wife's laughing? <laughs> Unless maybe the man's supposed to be the spiritual head of the house. Now, you got to get this, because this is powerful. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And please don't take offense. This is just the truth. Being like a woman, she said, I didn't laugh. That was my cousin. <laughs> now, can you imagine that? The gall that somebody would have to laugh at God and then lie. Who, oh, me? I didn't laugh. He says, I didn't laugh. Now she's afraid. She says, I didn't laugh. And Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Nevertheless, I'm, I'm going to give you the miracle, baby, anyway. Now, I have one more scripture. You don't have to turn to it. I'm going to turn to it. It's in the book of Hebrews. Okay? Chapter 11, verse 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. Here it is. Because she judged him faithful who had promised. I want to talk to you about the awesome results of judging the judge. Remember, God is the judge of all the earth. He's the judge. And yet he, he gives to human beings the privilege to judge him. And to pass judgment on him. Lord, help me one more time. I'm, I'm wearing out here. Please help me and let me be a blessing to these sweet people. Let the Holy Ghost work. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you. You know, to, to make a judgment is to come to a conclusion, to receive facts or figures what have you, and then after you weigh it all together, you make a judgment. And that, that, that becomes how you see something. I, I, I look at this story, and, and, and every time I look at it, it just it blows my mind. If you don't remember anything else I say tonight, remember this. Vision is the womb of the mind. You're not going to give birth to anything supernaturally if you can't see it. You've got to get a vision of it. You've got to see it. There's no mystery about it. You just have to perceive it and grasp it and see it, and you give birth to it. Now, you understand that God delights in setting the stage where things are impossible or improbable. He, he loves to walk into stuff and turn around and say, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and this. And your mouth drops open and hits the jaw and says, that's impossible. It just can't happen. Well, it's because it's impossible to our human reasoning. You see, that is the danger. We are living in a generation, even with Pentecostal people, where intellect is stronger than faith. 
You, you got to go past your intellect. You see, you're given five senses, and your five senses are five laboratory assistants that help you make judgments and interact in the world. You know, taste and see and hear and smell. You got touch. Those are yours. But when it comes to spiritual things, you need a sixth sense. And the sixth sense is faith. And that's why when you explain things to people who are highly educated or very intellectual, they find it very hard to grab a hold of that because, you see, watch, your intellect and your, your secular knowledge, your fleshly knowledge will take you to the edge and the precipice of the cavern. But you cannot jump across that cavern into the promise of God with intellect. It'll keep you here. You got to use faith to take you outside. You got you have to use faith to take you outside what is to inside what can be. And faith is such a, a requirement from God. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. You can have faith and not understand. See, if you're not careful, you think having faith means, oh, I got it. I got it. I've had a lot of things that God has done for me. I still ain't got it. I don't, you know, but he just said, well, I'm going to do this. Okay, I don't know how you're going to do it. But see, you don't want to wear a wart on your brain trying to figure out how it's going to happen. You're not hearing me yet. Okay. I need somebody who likes me. You, 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 you like me? Can I just tell you this as kindly as I can? The issue has never been the what. The issue has always been the who. See, if you're not careful, the what will frustrate you. The what will drive you crazy. The what will make your brain have a seizure. But if you understand who promised the what, the what's a piece of cake. I heard him say, it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. If you can understand who's promised you, the what's nothing. If you understand who is the creator, the sustainer of life, the master of the universe, the king of glory, the great I am. If you understand the who, the what doesn't scare you. You, you, you got to get, hear me now. I, I, I'm, I'm, now, please forgive me, Rev, 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 Pastor, whatever, whatever this is over here, okay? Forgive me, okay? But I'm going to get pretty close to things being rated X here, okay? And, but it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. You understand that, that Abraham and Sarah had tried to have children and weren't able to produce any. And, and, and he goes and has an affair with Hagar, and she produces it. And it's real easy. Why? Because Hagar is a servant of an Egyptians. And Egyptians can produce babies faster than promised people. Them Egyptians can pop them out like rabbits. But sometimes when you're a child of promise, it don't work that easy. And if you don't understand who's talking to you, your mistake will eventually mock your miracle. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because Hagar and Ishmael start laughing. And, and Abe says, we got to get him out of here. And Sarah says, we got to get him out of here. Now, you got to understand how impossible this situation was when this one being came up there was God himself. And he says, where is Sarah? She said, well, she's in the tent behind me. He said, uh, I'm going to give you a miracle child of her. Well, now the mind always says, no, I've gone through the change of life. I'm not reproducing. I cannot give birth to babies. And it's like God says, I can override any system. I'm not preaching any further till I hear somebody tell me something. I don't care what your diabetes says. I don't care what the cancer test says. I can override anything. I can reverse the curse. I can bring new life to you. I can fix anything that's wrong with you. I appreciate the skill and the medical ability of doctors, but doctors are not the last answer. I'm going for a second opinion. I'm going to somebody who can create eyeballs, who can resurrect kidneys, who can do all kinds of stuff. Woo. Woo. Uh, stay with me. Uh, 
I'm going as fast as I can. This is, this is so powerful. So he turns around, he walks, and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to give you a baby with, uh, I'm going to get crude. I'm going to give you a bambino. I'm going to give you a little bubula from Sarah. And Sarah's in the tent going, <laughs> now, now I, I, please forgive me, okay? I, I may not be coming back, okay? <laughs> Watch. Sarah's in the tent. Now, I, I'm taking a guess. It ceased to be with her after the man of a woman, right? She's through the, the change of life, fine. But there's something else. I don't think Abraham and Sarah are carrying on like they used to. I think when they go to bed at night, they're playing Uno. Your deal. They're not about ready to raise a family. When they went to bed at night, it was like some of us. See ya. <laughs> See you in the morning. Okay, uh, goodbye. <laughs> You're not getting it yet. Abraham, I'm flipping out. Abraham is 99 years old and Sarah is 90. Abraham is on a walker. <laughs> they both eat a cracker barrel. <laughs> Sarah is old. <laughs> now you're not getting it yet, okay. <laughs> you see, God, in order to get Abraham to have faith, had to take him for a walk. That's what he has to do with us sometimes. He gets ready to give him some unbelievable promises. And he said, come here, Abe, let's go for a walk. You see, sometimes in order to get your faith moved and activated, he's got to take you alone by yourself and start talking to you. And he starts talking to Abraham. He said, hey, look at the heavens and count the stars if you can. I'll wait. And, you know, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, eins, five, three, five, one, two, three, four. And he says, yeah, you can't do it. There's too many stars. He said, come on, let's go over here. You see the sand by the seashore? So shall I seed be. And God turns around and says to him what he's trying to tell us. Look, my promise will work at night and my promise will work at day. And I don't care how dark your nights get, you can look up and start counting them stars and it's a token of my faithfulness. And during the day when you're struggling with something, just look at the sand, because I have given you a witness that your seed is gonna be like the stars of heaven and like the sand by the seashore. Now, 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 now please forgive me, Rev. I'm not looking at you anymore, okay? I'm, I'm over here. I'm gonna people in the cheap seats. I'm going over here. You ready? Now he comes back from walking with God and God has told him, I'm going to give you a miracle baby with the chick. <laughs> now you watch. See if I'm not, <laughs> I'm old, but I'm not dead. <laughs> And I see Abraham coming back from his walk with God. And this is my mind. He's coming back and he's going, zippity doo da, zippity hey, my oh my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine coming my way. And when Sarah comes out of the tent, he goes, hey, good looking, what you got cooking? Want to mess around? <laughs> He's thrown his walker away. <laughs> he looks at Sarah and says, if you knew what I knew, we're going to have a baby. And Sarah's going, why? <laughs> now you're laughing at my expense, but you understand how impossible that was? 99 and 9? 
And God gives him a promise that I'm going to give you a miracle child from Sarah. I'm going to do something in your life that medically it's impossible. Intellectually it's impossible. It's never happened before. I wish you'd get the feeling like I'd like God to do something in my life that has never happened before. personally believing that before the rapture takes place we're going to see some stuff in the apostolic church that did not happen in the book of acts god is going to surpass himself god is going to go beyond what history said Woo! you can sit down i'm going as fast as i can so sarah hears that she's going to have a miracle baby she knows it's physically impossible it's chemically impossible. She starts laughing. When she starts laughing, God says, hey, how come Sarah's laughing? And Sarah's in the net going, you got to understand something. Because the first time she heard the promise, it was ridiculous. Till she realized who was talking. Don't let the what steal your faith. Don't let the what Steal your expectation. Find out who's giving the promise. Find out who's telling you something's going to happen. Because the who is greater than the what. Woo! Woo! Am, am, am I doing good yet? Am I, am I doing good yet? You, you, you understand? that They're, they're going to have a miracle baby. You, you see... What you got to do is, you got to do with Abraham, what it says in Romans 4, 17 through 21. said, Abraham considered not the deadness of his own body or the deadness of Sarah's room. Sometimes in order to have a miracle, it's not what you believe, it's what you refuse to accept. Operation consideration. I'm not going to consider that. I know it looks impossible. I know medically it's crazy. But the one who promised me has got all power, all knowledge, all wisdom, absolutely good, totally faithful, cannot lie. Oh, man. Listen, you're so close to the possible miracle right now. If you could believe that God has told you he'll give you the Holy Ghost or he'll touch your body or he'll heal a sickness or he'll encourage you or strengthen you, you need to latch on to who's talking and not get frustrated about what was told you. Woo! Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And here's the key to everything that I'm trying to tell you. Watch. Sarah went from being stunned and overwhelmed by a, a promise of a miracle child till she found out who she was laughing at. When she realized who was talking, God himself, she changed her position. And here's what she said. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. She judged him faithful. First time she heard it, she judged him foolish, crazy, insane, unable. But when she realized it was God himself that was talking through that being, she turned around and said, I judge him faithful. I heard one writer said, faithful is he who has promised, who will also do it. Has God said, shall he not do it? Has he spoken, shall he not bring it to pass? I wish I could get in your face right now. What miracle promises has God given to you that has yet to happen? You need to shake yourself loose and say, there's no time limit on God's promises. If God's promised you something, you need to believe him for you need to expect something great to happen. Yes. I'm trying the best I can. Hold on. Job said it this way. Lord, I know thou canst do everything. Yes, Jeremiah said, there's nothing too hard for thee. He told Virgin Mary when he, that angel showed up and said, you're going to have a baby without any sexual relations. God's just going to give you a baby. 
Well, that's impossible. Watch what Mary said. He's not like us Pentecostals. Mary said, I may not understand it. I have no reference point to it, but be it unto me according to thy word. When she goes and visits her cousin Elizabeth in 145, Elizabeth says, and blessed is she that has believed, for there shall be a performance of that which was promised her. You got to expect there's going to be a performance. God does not open his mouth to play games with people. When he tells you something unbelievable, believe it. I I, I wish I had, I'm, I'm not looking at you no more. I wish I had time. See, the issue is not it's impossible. The issue is one letter difference. It's him possible. For with God, All things are possible. The devil is a liar. I'm telling some of you right now. With God, all things are possible. You can live for God. You can have a good marriage. You can have good children. You can be a fine saint of God. Yes, you can. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. With God, all things are possible. So, so the issue... Please be seated for a second. The issue is not how good I preach. I don't mean to be rude. I preach good all the time. I don't preach bad sermons. I've heard some lousy ones. Them guys ought to be arrested. Trying to impersonate a preacher. Couldn't preach their way out of a Howard Johnson's bathroom. The door was unlocked. You say, well, that's being braggadocious. No, no. Anybody that preaches the truth is a good preacher. Any precious person that believes the truth is a good believer. Oh, yeah. I'm going to make you answer me. You know what? Some of the reasons why some people don't praise God and worship God better is they don't judge him worthy. They don't judge him faithful. They don't judge him interested like right now. I'll make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Well, I won't. You know what your problem is? You're dealing with the what. I'm dealing with the who. Who brought me out of the miry clay? Who set my feet on the rock to stay? I'm not concerned about the what. I don't care how impossible the what looks. I can't fix anything. I can't heal anybody. I can't deliver anybody. But I know a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Sit sit down. I, I don't mean to hurt your feelings. Uh, I'm just, you, you got to hear me. Please hear me. I did not say according to the power that dwelleth in you. We got too many saints that got the Holy Ghost and it's just there in park. Watch what it says. Unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power. Watch out. That worketh in us. Got too many people. It don't work. It just resides. And every once in a while, what a good move of God, we go, glory. We even get crazy, go, hallelujah. (laughs) You know what you got to do? Do what Paul told Timothy. Stir up the gift of God that is within you. Stir it up. Stir it up. Act up a little bit. Get a little crazy. Make some people uncomfortable. You don't know what kind of devils you're facing. You don't know what kind of crisis is coming your way. You need the Holy Ghost to be moving. You need the Holy Ghost to be working. You you can sit down. When when, when I was a boy, when I was a boy, they probably don't do it anymore, but when I was a boy, we used to get medicine from from the pharmacist. And on the label, it used to have something that was so cool. It used to have on the bottom, here's what it said. Shake well before using. Sometimes if you can't get anybody else to shake, you need to shake yourself. You need to shake yourself. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on. 
on, Holy Ghost. I need the Spirit of God to start working in my life and moving me beyond my comfort zone. You, you, you can sit down if you want to. I, I, and then you, I realize it's not all in the emotion. I understand that. Let me go a little further. And it ain't all in the sitting. And it ain't all in the staring. You mean to tell me you, you brushed your teeth, combed your hair, put some stinkum on, got dressed real nice so you can sit here like somebody's interested in you? You sweet gals come strutting down here just, just wearing your stuff, hoping somebody sees your dress, looks at your hat. Are you on drugs? Who gives a flip about your hat? Who gives a flip about how nice your dress looks? I need business with Jesus. I need Jesus to get a... I need the Holy Ghost to get a hold of me. And the key to your miracle is not having more faith or having more gifts of the Spirit operating in your life. It's simpler than that. And she judged him faithful who had promised. First she judged him foolish. Then she judged him faithful. Please be seated. Can I preach just a little bit? Just a little bit, okay? Just, you got to hear me. Listen. If I hit the wall when I start running, you pick me up, okay? Because I'm kind of half blind and I can't see, but man, there's something inside of me going, move and groove, baby. Hit it, get it, and go. Let's go. I'm, I'm about ready to take off running right now. When I think of who brought me out of sin and who put my name in the Lamb's Book of Life and who... Who baptized me with the Holy Ghost? Who said to me, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you and I'll never put on you more than you can bear? Who said, I will make a way of escape? I got to praise God. I got to act up. I got to get excited. I got something else for you. You need to get excited about who told you I'm coming back to get you. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trump, the trump's going to sound. The sky's going to split open. The king of glory's coming back for his bride. Woo. He's coming and we're going. And if that doesn't turn your motor on, you need an overhaul. You, you, you be seated. Excuse me for being so rude. My body's wearing out. Two strokes later, 90% deaf, 80% blind. I can still talk. I asked the Lord over and over again after this last stroke. I said, Lord, heal my eyes. And I felt the Holy Ghost say to me, why? I said, well, you know, so I could see better, I could read better, I can drive better. He said, it won't make you any more powerful if you're well. You can't heal nobody. Let me try it again. In the divine providence of God, there are times when God chooses not to fix stuff in people's lives who are his children. Because being whole doesn't make you any more powerful. That hit a sour note right then. I said, well, Lord, I want you to just fix my eyes. And he said, well, let me ask you something. If I don't fix your eyes, what you going to do about it? Um, mm -hmm. I'm suck my thumb. Um, oh, it's it's going to steal my praise and my song. I don't get my ears fixed and I don't get my eyes fixed and I don't get all this stroke stuff taken care of. I, you know, I know I look like Olympian ideal. I understand that. But do you understand right now, I have two titanium hips. 
I can't even get through an airport without I'm almost being molested. And they wand you. I said, I'm the original Mr. T. Now, wait a minute. I'm half blind. I'm 80% deaf. I got two artificial hips. I still dance. I still praise God. I still make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I still serve the Lord with gladness. Why? I'm fixing to get a new body in just a little while. I'm going to get a glorious body like unto his glorious body. So if God chooses not to fix me, it ain't going to shut me down. It's not going to steal my song. It's not going to steal my joy. I judge him faithful who has promised. Be seated just for a second. Do you understand how powerful that is? When you judge him faithful who promised, you realize that Naaman almost missed the miracle of the cleansing of his leprosy because he judged the what over the who. He looked at that dirty, muddy Jordan and said, that ain't going to work. You better be careful about judging the methods God tries to use in your life. I, I, I said I wasn't going to look at you. I'm just, I'm just drawing over to you, see? <clears throat> I'm going I'm to tell you. I didn't, I didn't tell the church my stroke story. I don't think I did. I didn't tell you this my story about my stroke. Last time I had the last stroke, I was reading my Bible, and I had this massive stroke, took me in the hospital, took me apart. <laughs> I bought so many cars, I could have been a car dealer. For all them doctors, I paid them bills. <laughs> and, and, and I got them praying and asking God, Lord, I have no problem with the fact that I've had this stroke and I'm half blind. I, I, that's, that's okay. I'm going to praise you and live for you. I'm going to pay my tithes. I'm going to try to witness to people. I'm going to have joy. I'm, I'm going to just, you ain't going to worry. I'm not going to be no Pentecostal sourpuss. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to be a Pentecostal nincompoop. I'm not going to be that either. Been too good to me. Now, for those of you that God's never been good to you, keep your mouth shut. But if he ever answered a prayer, if he ever made a way, if he ever turned things around, if he ever brought you out, you could at least say thank you. Sit, sit down. I got to go fast. Uh, What's it? It's uh, 7.30. 7.30. Okay, watch. So I'm asking God, what's going on? I go see this cardiologist. He takes my, my blood pressure. It had been 200 over 160, and, and I had that stroke. And now he, he checks me out, and he says, you know what your blood pressure is, Reverend? I said, no. He said, 118 over 78, and your pulse is 63. You're like a 25-year-old boy. You know, I'm going, all right. <laughs> <laughs> So he says, I don't know what else to do for you. We've done every test there is. We've done everything on you. We can't find out what caused your blood to spike. And if we don't find out, the next one's going to kill you. So he says, let me, let me check your carotid artery. He checks my carotid artery and he goes, my God, your pulse is over 200. Your blood has gone clear off the chart. How do you feel? I said, I feel fine. He says, stay right there. I'm going to do an EKG. He does an EKG. I had three of them. He does an EKG and he goes, you just totally failed it. I know what caused your stroke, and I know what caused the other stroke when you preached at impact conference and fell over dead for 15 minutes. I said, well, lay it on me, doc, because I don't want to buy you guys any more cars. <laughs> he says, you're suffering from atrial fibrillation. I said, what is that in English? He said, we call it AFib. The top section of your heart is shaking like a bowl of jello. <laughs> And that blood that goes in between there coagulates. And then when you go back into pulsing, that goo went behind your brain and gave you a stroke. So we got to help you with that. I said, well, okay. So I go to the house. Excuse me to, if I'm boring you. Excuse me. I'm praying. I said, Lord, thank you for letting Dr. Tully, my cardiologist, find out that I had AFib. 
thank you for letting him find that because I've been through all these doctors and nobody knows. So I said, I have no problem with having a stroke or having AFib. You've taken care of me. It'll be okay. And if I kick the bucket, I'm going to your house and eat for free. So it don't much matter. <laughs> so I'm fine. So I'm walking through the house. I told brother, I told brother, uh, what's your name? <laughs> Woodward, Woodward. See, that's one of the problems you have with a stroke. You have short-term memory loss. And, and, and I'm walking through the house, and I hear the voice of God. Just as clear as a bell. And he says, your brother Richard. And I went, my brother, I found my brother Richard dead in his house 10 years ago. And I flew him up to New York, and I preached his funeral and buried him. But I'm standing in the dark in my living room, and I'm going, my brother Richard. What's the deal with my brother Richard? The voice comes back and says, what did he die from? Well, I knew because they did an autopsy because he died in his house. And I said, lethal arrhythmia. And the voice spoke again and said, right. And that's where you were heading. And neither you nor the medical people knew what was wrong with you. So I let you have the stroke so it could be discovered, so you could be delivered because you have a destiny. I'm not worried about the what. I'm thrilled about the who. Am I making sense yet? Oh, just sit, sit one more second and I'll get back to my sermon. So I take a few steps. I want to tell Sister Arnold what I feel the Holy Ghost just spoke to me. And I stop in the dark and I turn around. New Yorkers are argumentative people. And, and I, I turn around and I said, wait a minute. I'm in the dark. There's nobody there. And I said, you knew I had AFib. And you could have healed me while I was flying a plane or while I was preaching a sermon or while I was sleeping or while I was playing handball. You, you could have helped me. You could have healed me anytime you wanted to. The voice came back like thunder. <laughs> Said, yes, I could have. But you would never have known it. But now that you know it, it will change your praying. It will change your praising. It will change your lifestyle. It will change the way you look at things. So even though I don't like being blind and not hearing, I thank God for what he did for me because I'm praying better. I'm doing better. I'm worshiping better. I'm more forgiving. I'm trying to be a kinder person because I'm on borrowed time. Let, let, let me help you with this. Please be seated. I, I, I hope I'm not boring you. you. You don't have to pay me. You don't have to pay me. Don't pay me. I'm, I'm a millionaire. I'm a millionaire. Ask all the people that don't tithe. I'm a millionaire. You ready? This is so powerful. Do you understand that the majority of the miracles that took place in Jesus' life were the direct results of how they judged him? Two blind men, Matthew 9, 27. The Bible said, two blind men. Now, you explain this to me. You're the theologian. Two blind men followed him and cried unto him. Read it, 927. They cried unto him, Lord Jesus. He ignored them. He kept walking. Stop sucking your thumb when you don't get a two-minute answer. There's times when God will walk by to see if you'll go after it. He didn't answer them. He goes about the next verse, verse 28. And they follow him into the house. Come on, you preacher guys, you pastors, you multimillionaire guys. Let me ask you something. How'd they find the house? They're blind. Same reason I have to ask you, how did the guy in John 9 find the pool of Siloam? He's blind. The only answer I can come up with is somebody who can see helped them. Somebody who can see, help them. Somebody, you can be a witness for the kingdom. You can be a guidance counselor for somebody. You can bring somebody into the truth of God because you see. I'm, all, I'm almost finished. Sit down. I'm almost finished. And all you folks that are staying seated, stay seated. That's fine. You ready? He walks up to him. And they knock on the door. Hey, Mr. Jesus, uh, 
We, we, want, we want you to open our eyes. Now watch what Jesus says. Believest thou that I'm able to do this? Other words, you believe I'm able? Yes. You believe if I say I'll do it, I'll do it? Yes. He said, believest thou that I'm able to do this? And he said, and they say, yea, Lord. And he said, well, and unto your faith be it unto you. And both guys' eyes opened up. Why? Because they judged him faithful who promised. Hey, you're, not, you're not getting it yet. That leper in Matthew 8 runs up. The Bible said he comes down from the Mount of, of the Sermon on the Mount. And, and, and he runs up. The Bible said worshiping. He said, Lord, if you will... I know you can make me whole. That's exactly where the United Pentecostal Church is worldwide. We are totally convinced he's able, but we're not totally convinced he will. In this service right now, God would heal a bunch of people instantly if you could get faithful to believe that he's faithful. See, I lost half of you just now. He said, if you will... I know you can make me whole. He's the only guy I can find in the entire Bible that ever asked God Almighty whether it was his will to heal. You won't find no one. I don't care how much you know. I know the whole book. He's the only guy that ever asked Jesus whether it was the will of God to be healed. He said, if you will, you can make me whole. And Jesus said, oh, the only problem you got is whether it's my will. It is my will. Be whole. Boom. And he healed him instantly. Now, too bad Jesus ain't alive today. Boy, if Jesus was alive today, we could have a heyday. Too bad he's changed, like some of these theologians have said. But he don't change. He's Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I know you are great Bible people, but if I was a betting man, and I'm not allowed to bet, but I used to bet. If I was a betting man, I'd bet you $1,000 to a hole in the donut. There's not 10 people in this whole building who can quote Hebrews 13 and 9. We quote her 13 and 8 because that's our candy stick. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah, but what does 13 and 9 say? I've gone all over this movement. I haven't found one preacher that even do it. I'm not going to ask you guys either. You just look the other way, okay? We want, we want you to keep your image. Just hold on. You ready? Here's what 13 and 9 says. Beware, brethren, of them that come among you. Here it is. Bringing strange doctrines. What strange doctrines? He's not the same. He's changed. He doesn't heal anymore. He doesn't give the Holy Ghost anymore. He doesn't do, ah, he doesn't do miracle signs and wonders anymore. The devil is a liar. He has never changed. He's got as much power now as he ever had. And he's as willing right now to save, to heal, to bless, to deliver. All you got to do is judge him faithful who has promised. Can, can, can I preach another five minutes? Can, sit down here. Boy, you guys are going to wear the crease out of your drawers, man. Take it easy here, bud. You ready? Here, here comes the woman with the issue of blood. She's been sick for 12 years. She's doctored out. She's financially wiped out. And she heard about Jesus. I'd like, boy, I wish I had time. I'd like to ask a question. What have you heard about him? She heard something about him that sparked interest in her. Said, man, he opens blinded eyes. He walks on the sea. He calls dead men. They come back to life. Said, Whew. And the Bible says when she heard of Jesus, she went after him. Now watch. Remember what I said to you this morning? I don't know whether you remembered. I said it this morning. Be careful when you talk to, last night, be careful when you talk to yourself. What you tell yourself. If you read Mark 5, 25 on, it says, and the woman with the issue of blood said within herself, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. She didn't ask whether it was the will of God. She didn't ask whether this sickness was a blessing from God. She said, I got to get rid of this junk. And this man's got power. Do you realize, now I, I'm going to mess with your theology in Canada. 
But you don't need scripture to have something happen. I preached all over this movement. I've been beat up and damned and condemned and challenged and railed on about saying stuff and said, well, you got to have two. Give me two scriptures. Give me two scriptures. I need at least two scriptures. You're nuts. You don't need anything. How many scriptures did Moses have when he opened the Red Sea? How many scriptures did Josh have when he rolled back to Jordan? You don't need scriptures to validate faith in God. He that comes to God must believe that God is and God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, wait a minute. I, I, I'm messing with you now. I'm, I've got a divided house on my hands. I can feel it. Listen to me. That woman had no scripture that you could touch a piece of fabric. That was unheard of. That's the first lady we ever find who touched a piece of cloth. A piece of fabric. I know the great message you preach about the hem and the tassel and all that stuff. Fine. But she, she set a precedence. She said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, boom, I'll be whole. I've always loved that story. Why? Because she got down to his feet because it's always crowded at his hands. It's never crowded at his feet. And she climbed down there and touched the hem of his garment. The Bible said when she did, boom, he said virtue flew out of him. And he turned around and said, who touched me? And you know what Peter said. He said, my Lord, you're being jostled all around with all these people. Who touched me? He said, no, boy, there's a difference between touching me and bumping into me. One is on purpose, one is accidental. We need some people in this service now that touch him on purpose, that reach to him on purpose. Please be seated. I know that geometry tells us that the shortest distance between two places is a straight line. Not for Jesus. He was going to point B, leaving point A, but he went the long way around. Yes, he, did. He, he went through the crowds. Yes, sir. As if to say, touch me if you can. Huh. Touch me if you want to. Wow. I'll slow my pace down for all you people that are so reserved. <laughs> Go ahead. Isn't it funny? She's the only gal that got healed, and she's the only one that touched him. And after she got healed, it blows my mind that nobody else in the crowd tried to get healed. They just had their mouths open. So, oh, it's not something. That was neat. She got healed. Touched the garment. If you go to your Bible to chapter 6, which is the next chapter, verses 54, 5, and 6, it says when it was noised abroad that Jesus came across the sea and they began to lay the sick out in the streets. Watch this. And many came hoping that they might but touch the hem of his garment. She set a precedence. Yes. You could be someone right now on your pew, in your situation, that decided to bust a move, decided to do something unusual, something beyond protocol, and just turn around, and you might be able to cause a, an absolute tidal wave across your whole pew that people would start being healed, and people would start being blessed, and people would start being delivered if you just judge him faithful who has promised. I'm, I'm going as fast as I can, Rev. But, but, but you got to hear me. This is so powerful. How are you judging Jesus? Because there's results from that. Israel judged Jesus as a Sabbath breaker, a troublemaker, a law violator. And they missed the miracle ministry. We Pentecostals can judge him as someone who forgives your sins, gives you the Holy Ghost, and then it's over. We, we tolerate too much stuff that Jesus Christ was beat half to death to fix. Now, I don't, I'm sorry I'm offending some of you, but listen to me. Jesus did not have to go to a pilot's whipping post to get beat half to death because he was not beaten with those stripes for your forgiveness. 
According to 1 Peter 2.24, he was hung on the tree. He bore our sins on the tree, but he bore our sickness at the post. And if we're not utilizing what he did, he suffered in vain. Come on, I'm going to make you do it. I can't hardly see you. Put your finger on your chest. Said, he wants me well. He wants me better. He's promised. He's promised. These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. They'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. You got to hear me. I wish I could convince you. Jesus Christ the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. He's got all the power he's ever had. He's got all the goodness and grace and mercy he's ever had. He wants to bless you. And while it may seem crazy like it did to Sarah when she judged him faithful, she got pregnant with a miracle child. I, I, I need five minutes, okay? Five minutes. I'm, I'm struggling here. And I, I'm, I'm trying not to be abrasive or abusive, but you, you, you got to help me. If we Pentecostals don't get our head out of the sand, we're just going to be people that dress funny and act funny. We're just going to be people that we live funny. I, I, as far as I know, those disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, even including Judas, because Judas was used by God to heal the sick and cast out devils also. Those 11 guys with Judas saw more miracles, signs, and wonders than any group of men that's ever been recorded in the Bible. They saw the dead raised. They saw lepers cleansed. They saw deaf ears open, blind eyes open, cripples walk. They saw all that. But when you get to Acts chapter 4 and verse 29, Peter prays a very strange prayer. He says, now, Lord, behold their threatenings. That's what some of us need. We need some threatenings. Behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants boldness that we may preach thy word. Here, why? Here's what he's asking for. By stretching forth thine hand that signs and wonders and miracles would be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. If Peter had enough boldness to ask God, we need some more juice, we need some more power, we need some more anointing, we need the miraculous. We are raising a generation in the Pentecostal movement that doesn't hardly believe in miracles except talk. See what I mean? Uh, now, I'm not a healer. I can't heal nobody. I couldn't heal a headache on a dead frog. I can't heal nobody. Okay? But I'm a believer. And I'm an ambassador. Uh, Bishop, uh, take this to the general board, okay? And tell them I sent it with love. Okay? <laughs> Listen to me. Watch what Paul says. Romans 15, verses 18 and 19. He said, I have gone around the area of Illyricum. And other places, and watch this. And I have made the Gentiles obedient to the gospel. Here he goes. As I have fully preached the gospel. Now watch this. With mighty signs and wonders and miracles. If we are not having mighty signs, wonders, and miracles, we are not fully preaching the gospel. We are preaching Acts 2.38, the new birth and entrance into the kingdom. Boy, God. You know what our problem is? One, we don't think we're worthy. And two, we're not sure he's faithful. Watch this. Sarah laughed at him like he was a fool. When she found out it was God incarnate talking, she changed her attitude. When she changed her attitude, she judged him faithful. This is what's so powerful. Her mockery, her unbelief, her laughter never disqualified her from getting the miracle. So whatever you and I have 
accidentally or intentionally done up to this point. It has not disqualified us from experiencing the miraculous and the supernatural and the blessings and the richness of the Holy Ghost. Okay, hey, my, you sit up. Boys, will you sit down? I'm going back here with the super glued people. You ain't making me afraid. I ain't afraid of nobody. I don't need, I've been thrown out of places. It's okay. You're going to hear me. I'm, a, I'm talking to you Pentecostals. You sweet gray-haired people that have kept the torch of faith for years and years and, and helped this church to grow. I'm asking you to get stirred and shaken and saying, wait a minute. We need to rediscover some things that belong to our heritage. Now, see, when you get to preaching on miracle signs and wonders, people get real nervous. And they get real scared. Well, let me help you with it. If they've got cancer in heaven, keep yours. If they've got diabetes in heaven, keep yours. If they've got all these dumb diseases in heaven, keep yours. Because the Bible said he taught them to pray, Our Father which heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So as it is in heaven is the standard. We tolerate stuff we should not tolerate. God wants me well. God wants me whole. If he trusts me with a sickness, fine. I'll just have to deal with it. But I'm not giving up on God. I still believe he's a healer. I still believe he'll fix anything. He can straighten anything out anytime he wants. But I got to find some people that judge him faithful. I, I, I'm almost finished, Rev. I'm... I'm sorry to cause you so much trouble. I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry I'm not helping your people. You just, you're, you're boxed in here. You just, you don't get it. And the nobleman heard that Jesus was come out of Capernaum in Galilee. And he comes down and he says, come down and heal my boy. He said, my boy's at the point of death. Uh, come and heal him. Now, that's a, that's a sympathy of a dad. His boy is sick unto death. He, come down here, my boy. Well, you know, Jesus gives a strange statement. He goes, except you see signs and wonders, you'll not believe. That was so cold and brutal. Boom. And he goes, come down here, my boy, die. Watch this. Jesus turns around and gives a revelation. He said, I'll give you something as powerful as my presence. What? I'll give you my word. Go thy way, thy son liveth. Boy, how long has it been since you've walked in trust? All the way down, wondering, every lying devil trying to tell him he made a mistake and what have you. And when he gets there, the boy has got better. He began to amend. Listen, you may not have the physical presence of Jesus in this house, but you've got something equally as powerful. He has given you his word. And where the word of the king is, there is life. I need somebody to break out praising God for just a minute. I need somebody to start judging him faithful who has promised. You're not disqualified from the miracle. You're not disqualified from the mercy of God. You're not disqualified from the blessings of God. Just turn your attitude around and judge him faithful who promised. All right, I'm, I'm going to close. Sorry I didn't help you. I really wanted to help you so bad. I wanted to help you. I'm not able to help you. I'm trying. Just not able to help you. I just... Whew. Let me try one more. Hannah is in the temple. And she wants to have a baby. Penina, she, she's putting out kids like a rabbit. She just whoosh, 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 whoosh. She's, she's just producing babies left and right. Okay? And the Bible says that she provoked Hannah and grieved her. 
Now, now I learned something that I'd never learned from, from sermons and notes and stuff like that. I was asking the Lord, I said, this lady's hurting and she's trying to have a baby and, and, and this other lady's having babies left and right and she can't have a baby. Why, why are you letting Hannah be tormented by this stupid Penina? Why are you doing that? And I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, real easy. I never intended for Penina to get on her nerves. I intended for Penina to put her on her knees. And when she got in the temple and got on her knees and began to pray without making words and she got judged by that big fat slob, Eli, says, get that whiskey away from you. Get that strong drink away. I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I, I'm wanting a child. And watch what Eli says. He's spiritual as a dead frog. He says, the Lord grant you your request. And she believed what this man of God said, even though he was in bad shape. She judged him faithful. Watch what the next verse says. She's not pregnant. She's not pregnant. She doesn't have a baby on the way. But the Bible says when she got that word from the priest, her countenance was no more sad. And she went and got to worshiping God. You got to sometimes act on the word before the word acts on you. If you've got a promise from God, then react to it and respond to it like it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but you need to grab a hold of it and judge him faithful who has promised. Come on, you can stand with me. I preached long enough. I, I, I'm so sorry I didn't preach better. I wouldn't buy this tape if I was you. I'll just go get another tape somewhere if I'm. Just, just think of all the people in the, in the Bible that received miracles that didn't have promises. Had no promises. And they came anyway. That Syrophoenician woman, she was outside the covenant promises of God. And she says, hey, my, my daughter's got a devil in her. Come cast the devil out. And, and I don't mean to hurt your feelings, Rev, but he said, it's not fit to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Now watch what he just said. The children's bread is healing. The children's bread is miracles and deliverance. And it belongs to people who are in covenant with him. But that woman said, yeah, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And he turns around and says, woman, for this saying, the devil's gone out of your daughter. He can do things right now, long distance. You got kids that are away from God, he can touch them right now. You got family members away from God, he can reach out miles away and touch them right now. There's no distance with deity. There's no distance with his power. Why don't you begin to believe God for your loved ones, for your children, for your fellow workers, for your family? I'm, I'm closing. I'm closing. Thank you for listening. Sorry I didn't do better. I'm just doing the best I can. I just, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm impacted by the, the, the apathy and the lethargy. You're wonderful people. You're one of the finest worshiping churches I've ever been in my life. But, the, but there's still this thing like, oh, well, oh, well. Why should I pursue? What did I tell you last year when I was here? You're never going to possess what you don't pursue. And you're never going to pursue unless you're persuaded that you can have it. Right now, right now, I am persuaded the Lord Jesus Christ is moving through this house. And like Bartimaeus of old, sitting on the side, blind as a bat, Here's the people saying, it's Jesus of Nazareth. I wonder if anybody in this house would have the courage or the pizzazz or whatever to do what Bartimaeus did. Hey, Jesus! Have mercy!
mercy on me. Don't pass me by. Don't leave me the way I am. Touch me, change me, turn me around. Make me a better person. Make me what? Jesus! Woo! Woo! You ready? Watch this. I'll give you one for free. You can go preach it. You ready? The Bible said, and Jesus passing by, and Bartimaeus starts his Comanche war hoop. Ah! Jesus! Watch what the next verse says. And Jesus stood still. There's the message. The cry that stops God. Right now, the cry that stops God. You've got the ability to make that cry right now. You've got the ability. Come on, come on, let it get out. Hey, Jesus! Hey! I need you, I need you. I need you to touch me. I need you to heal me. I need, whoa, whoa! Whoa! I need you. Don't pass me by. I trust you. You're faithful. Help me now. 